The magic of film has been a lifelong obsession of mine, and horror effects go high on that list. From what's considered the first horror film made by the father of special effects, George Milius, to Carl Dreyer's impressive vampire from 1932, the universal monsters, or the horror of the 70s and 80s, special and visual effects have been instrumental in creating the things that go bump in the night and rattle around in our nightmares. So today, as always in this series, we're going to take a look at some work that utilized insane amounts of artistry and ingenuity and see if you can guess how these effects were done before we tell you. As always, you're gonna watch a clip and then you're gonna to try to figure out how they did the effect in the time frame they did with what they had available to them. Okie dokes. And then I press play and on the space bar. Correct. Are you ready? I'm ready. And go. This is me when I'm hungry. The blood spur just looks like a squib. I mean, it works really well, especially on that first entry wound. That's not his body anymore. Yeah, isn't that where he's like hidden under the table? Yeah, even over here, like the shirt's kind of stretched. It's for sure, it's like a like a system. Like he's in maybe in the table or something. Alien is easily one of the greatest sci-fi horror films ever made with visuals that changed sci-fi forever. And of course, this iconic moment of bloody horror that shocked audiences on its release. More than likely, just as Josh and Justin did, you guessed how this was done, but the technique is still awesome nonetheless and done in two shots. First was that initial burst of blood behind the shirt, which was done with a tube and compressed air underneath his shirt. After that, they cleared the set so that the actors couldn't see how they set up for that second infamous shot, which was done in the same way that you've seen in many other films where a part of the actor's body is above whatever the surface is, while the rest of their body would be hidden underneath whatever that thing is. This way, the rest of the body on top can be a false body for whatever gory effects are needed. In this case, John Hurt's head and arms are above the table with the rest underneath. This way, his torso could be replaced with that false chest that the alien could burst through. And interestingly, the first quick shot of the alien bursting through, but not breaking the shirt was a mistake. The alien was supposed to break all the way through, but on the first attempt, it got stuck on the fabric. But in the end, the mistake gave the editor more to work with and made the scene that much more intense. Another fun fact is that while the cast knew generally what was going to happen, they didn't know it would be accompanied by a burst of blood that they would all be sprayed with. So a lot of the reactions were enhanced by that actual shock of the brutality of the moment while filming. Blood? No. Push it out. Pump it. Snarl, snarl, okay, and the head back, snarl, go! It almost looked like the spider we killed this morning. Wasn't some of these animatronics, what year was, 86? Ooh, that thing looked like a weenie. I didn't like that. Didn't they do the neck wrap like in reverse? It's running with a mixture of animatronics and puppeteering, and then the wrapping around the neck that looks like the shots in reverse. While this shot isn't one of the most obviously impressive shots in the film, its execution and simplicity has always been one of my favorites. And for me, this scene as a whole is the most intense in the film. Ripley and Newt locked in the room with two face huggers somewhere in there with them. But again, this moment of the face hugger jumping over the table leg is both effective and hilariously simple. The moment was done in three shots. First was the face hugger that could run, which was essentially a pool toy with a wheel inside the body that would spin as it moved to make the legs move move and another wheel on the back that would do the same for the tail. So this first shot had that face hugger running up to the spot and would stop. For the second shot, they placed a rubber only version on the table leg with a string attached so it could be pulled back down to the spot that the toy face hugger stopped at. The third shot once again started on the table leg and again they used a string to pull it toward the camera. In post, they reversed that second shot so the face hugger was jumping onto the leg instead of being pulled away from it. Then they cut those three together very quickly to get their final moment. Moment. And that wasn't the only clever use of reverse photography. The tail wrapping around Ripley's neck was done in the same way. In reality, they pulled the tail off, but in the final reverse shot, you get that great effect of it wrapping around her neck. But something that's fun here is if you go frame by frame, once it cuts to the third shot, you can see the string, a light change, and even things within the frame that have moved from one shot to the other. But in full motion, the shot still works great. And I love that. I know this one. This one I know. The hand stretch is pretty fun. 
<laughs> Ass cheeks. Yeah, there's a lot going on there. Yeah, some of it's just good makeup, and then some of it feels a little animatronic with the ear. But with the stretching of the hand, that's the most interesting to me. They just, like, incrementally did makeup on him and then, like, animatronic stuff, too? Yeah, but the blowing up of the back? It feels like the same idea that they're able just to have some animatronic things that can balloon like that. Similar to the chest burst scene, the transformation scene in American Werewolf in London shocked audiences when it was released in 1981. It was something that hadn't been seen quite like that at the time, thanks to the incredible effects work of Rick Baker. To get the scene done, they shot it mostly in reverse order, beginning with the character fully hairy, then trimming some of that back, getting another shot, and so on. And like Alien, it utilized some reverse photography as well, like with the close-ups of the hair growth. With that, the hair was already through the process aesthetic and then they pulled it back so that they could reverse it in post and get that growing seamlessly. But what really set this scene over the edge was seeing the character's body elongate and change into the beast. This was done by creating prosthetics around mechanisms that would stretch the false body parts out as needed. So once again, this was likely done in a way you already guessed, but the artistry here is still incredible. And the thing that has stuck with me the most is something Rick Baker said in the behind the scenes. The, the transformation didn't really take all that long to actually shoot the physical things and these change your heads that we made you know john would say action it would go and stretch out and you go cut and it's like okay we've got that and it's like we've got that i mean i just spent months working on this thing and you you, you shot it took you 10 seconds to shoot it you know well i got it you know it's like well god you know it was like disappointing to think of all that time going into that but then i went with my crew of kids you know to westwood to see the movie when it came out with a real audience and when that 10 seconds happened of, of that face stretching out people stood up and cheered you know and it was like all right you know this is this is why we did that <laughs> It's a very relatable thought, but in the end, this became one of the most memorable moments in cinema history. There's more to come, but before we get to that, I wanna thank Musicbed, which Musicbed is one of the only brands I trust when it comes to storytelling. There's tons of options for music that have helped push whatever emotion my story needs. And it helps that they have the largest roster of independent artists with over 40,000 songs that you will not find anywhere else. They're also the most curated. Musicbed handpicks every artist in its exclusive roster, which are all curated for your film TV. TV and advertising projects. So take your films and projects to the next level with Musicbed and you can hear the difference for yourself and sign up for a free account. And when you fall in love with it and want to upgrade, use the code FILMRIOT at checkout to receive one month free when you purchase an annual subscription. Oh, baby Johnny Depp. He's so little. Homeboy sleeping with a portable TV on a scrotum. I actually don't know how they did the blood, but I, my guess would be is that it's upside down and they're just pouring the blood in. That reminds me of It. Feels like they just literally uh, built a set upside down and then dumped the blood that way. I saw Nightmare on Elm Street when HBO was still doing those random free previews. I was way too young for it at the time and my parents had no idea. And it was this scene that stuck with me the most. Actually, it was this scene that stuck with me the most. <laughs> but this was a close second, probably because I had never seen anything so brutally visceral at the time. And as Justin and Josh guessed, the room was upside down. But the set wasn't built for this effect. It was repurposed from its original use in Tina's death scene where she gets pulled up the wall and along the ceiling. When it was time for Johnny Depp's death scene, which I always forget that Johnny Depp is in this movie. <laughs> But when it came time for that scene, they decided to come back to that set to repurpose it by flipping it upside down so the blood could flow through violently. So while the simple answer is the shot was done upside down, pulling off the effect was anything but simple. First was the fact that they had one take at this for obvious reasons. But with the set upside down, the crew on top of the set poured gallons of blood colored water into the room. And that's where things started going wrong. The second the blood hit the ceiling light inside the set, it immediately electrified the water and and electrocuted the crew member pouring the water in on top of the set. But that was only the first problem. Now the electrified water then began to slosh from side to side, which messed up the balance of the room, making the whole rig shift and making the operators that controlled the set's position completely lose control of that rig. The room rolled back around, making crew members jump out of the way of cables and ropes that were ripped out. And later, Wes Craven said the water went into all the lights and there were these huge flashes 
in the dark. We were spinning in the dark and all these sparks were going on. Apparently the crew was left attached and suspended upside down for around 20 minutes until all the water poured out of the rig. But in the end, all of those mistakes led to one massively memorable sequence. I never noticed that Harry Potter's uncle was in this. I don't know if I've ever seen a severed head scene where it spins like that. I have no idea. Part of it feels like it goes from a practical effect to VFX. Maybe a mixture of practical and him on green screen to like spin the head. Because if that's practical, that's crazy. I don't know how they, they would do that practically. I'm gonna say a mixture of practical and green screen. It feels like they had the, the body there and they actually cut it off. But then when it spins, it feels like just a 3D rendering of the guy's face spinning. Sleepy Hollow is our most recent film on the list and easily my favorite Burton film. It's an absolute masterclass in atmosphere and lands a tone that makes this adaptation just perfect. A part of that tone comes from the fact that they shot almost entirely on stages and took a highly stylized approach to the violence, like with these beheading scenes. Specifically here with Magistrate Phillips's death scene where there were two rigs built for the gag. First was the rig that could spin the head replica around on a plate and even lift up to start the appearance of that head severing from the body. Next was the coolest part, a full body rig for the wide shot that was held together by this internal skeleton that was held together by electromagnets. So it could stand rigid and upright, but then on cue, they could release the magnets in the order that they wanted, so the knees would give, then the ankles, the waist, and so on, to give this natural look to the body's collapse. Another impressive mechanical gag in the film is one that's meant to go completely unnoticed. Although Christopher Walken isn't shown on the horse many times in the film, he still had to ride one. And with Walken apparently afraid of horses, they opted to go with this mechanical one. The great part about this is this was a horse rig built for an Elizabeth Taylor film called National Velvet from 1944. Although it was so old, the mechanics of it were so good that the crew didn't have to do much to it and could mostly use it as is, with just a few additions like the smoke coming out of the horse's nostrils. I forgot that he comes out like a, out of like a butthole. Ugh. I say it kind of looks uh, completely CG but not in a bad way. Huh. It feels like they just had it, the horse on some, like as a plate on a green screen of it coming through with some of that practical blood and then just placed it in the hole of this actual set. Yeah, I would say, I would say it, they just did that. CG. This is the type of effect that I love, one that uses multiple techniques to land a great moment. While this would likely be done fully CG nowadays, this moment from a 24-year-old film holds up because they didn't do that. To make it work, they first had their background plate, which has no horse or horseman, but you can see that they added practical interactions with the environment to help glue the composite later on. Then they shot an actual horse and horseman against a blue screen jumping over an obstacle. Then they could composite that live action asset into the main plate. After that, they mixed in some digital fog and leaves to supplement the practical interaction that they already had. And then they cut to a shot of the horse and rider all in camera to lock it all in. But it's the use of all of those elements that makes this shot hold up until today. You have leaves being disturbed in camera that could be used as reference for the VFX later on, and a real horse and horseman to composite into the shot. That's not to demonize CG of today, this film was again released 24 years ago and has plenty of digital elements and wonderful visual effects work, but it's the marriage of those different techniques that to me makes this timeless. But that's it, a few horror effects for your Halloween loving hearts. As always, if you have some shots that you'd like to see explained on the show or just some that are your favorites, post those in the comments below. And until next time, don't forget to write, shoot, edit, repeat. Mm -hmm.